Okay, so I want you to keep in mind because our background is what brings us, if we're here talking about trauma, we probably have some and we've seen a lot and we heard a lot and we want answers and we, and we want to be recognized. I'm not crazy. I know what I've experienced and I know how I got better. And I have now many years of experience in watching people respond, watching people get better. And I'm tired of being re-traumatized and, and told that I can't treat trauma. My first job at Mary Greeley, I learned to call it grief, loss, and anger, because that's what people had. And that was palatable for people. Now they've come around 20 years later. So I want you to think about your own background and what brings you here. And if anything gets brought up in you today, just jot that down mentally or otherwise and just pay attention for yourself. Now we're going to talk about trauma. What it is, what are the effects of it, and who is affected. Mark Epstein is kind of a Buddhist um, psychiatrist. He wrote a book called The Trauma of Everyday Life. He says trauma is not just the result of major disasters. It doesn't happen to only some people. An undercurrent of trauma runs through ordinary life, shot through as it is with the poignancy of impermanence. Our world is unstable and unpredictable and operates to a great degree and despite incredible scientific advancement outside our ability to control it. And we really found that out in our country when 9-11 happened. But many countries, this has been the norm for decades and hundreds of years. So now we're starting to go, oh. Now, I want to ask a question because I usually get asked the question. Does anyone object to me saying that we all experience trauma? Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Does anybody object to that use of the word? Okay. Several times I've been set, I've had the question put out to me, why do you say we all have trauma? I haven't had any trauma in my life. I said, did you live here when 9-11 happened? Well, yeah. Do you send your children to school? Well, yeah. Do you never think about there could be a school shooting where your, your children are? Oh, well, yeah, I do think about that. Even if something direct hasn't happened to you, we now live in a culture where, with all the wonderful technology, we know things like that. And it's fast and furious. And so it's important for us to kind of recognize this. And I'm not saying get bogged down, oh, woe is me. Uh, that's not what we're here for. We want to see something. We want to see that we are resilient and that we can cope. But we also need support. We need compassion. We need to recognize this. Going like this with trauma <laughs> doesn't make it go away. So this is a clip from a film called Prozac Nation. And I'm going to show it to you because I want you to see what one of the things that we can call trauma, or many of the things. Because again, in places where I worked, a client will come in and describe this kind of background that you're going to see. And the nurse practitioner would say, well, she didn't get hit. Nobody raped her. She doesn't have trauma. So one thing I want you to do as you watch this clip is pay attention to your breathing and check in with your body and see what happens as you watch this little clip. Or complex trauma because what do we see in her as an adult difficulties with emotion regulation difficulties with relationships so if you were working with her or you met her in your set setting how are you going to work with that trauma she doesn't know she has trauma what do you consider what diagnoses might you utilize What treatment approaches and what medications might you expect and what outcomes would you expect? <clears throat> what outcomes would you expect for her without a recognition of trauma, without what we now call good trauma-informed ther therapy? Anybody, what, what might you expect in a few years from her? 
a suicide, self-injury, self how about addictions? Probably some already going on, All right? So I encourage you, it's a really great movie, Prozac Nation. Um, well worth watching. So now we're going to talk about two different categories of trauma. We call it shock trauma, event-specific trauma. Then there's chronic, relational, or complex trauma. So there are disasters, so-called natural disasters, auto accidents, floods, moving to a new, new location, especially if it's done a lot, and under what circumstances can be traumatic for children, death of a loved and significant person. I've met many people who, they're in their 30s, and their trauma was that their grandfather died, and this was the, the only close person to them. And this was traumatic for them. Divorce can be traumatic, and when we talk about divorce, please don't get me wrong, I'm not putting down people who've had divorce, I have. So that's not the point of it. This, this is not about blame and shame. This is about recognizing something, something that happens to people. Some people are still affected. They still hope their parents get to back together when they're 40 years old. An injury can be traumatic. Illness, long-term illnesses, separation from loved ones, terrorism, of course, violence, including rape, physical assault, and robbery, and then war injury of a loved one or oneself. I know that there's many more that are being left out. So one thing I always ask people to do is please email me with the ones that you think need to be in there. But the point is, these things happen in a space and time, in a window of time. They're an event in a person's life. These things fit the DSM-4's criteria for PTSD. The DSM-5 has changed a little bit. to be a little more inclusive, not quite as much as we need it to be. But Now, the chronic relational complex trauma can be a family member's ongoing physical or mental illness, addiction, and their behavior, ongoing physical, emotional, verbal, mental, sexual abuse, neglect, poverty, growing up in poverty can be that. Does anybody know of a book called Five Little, Five Little Peppers and How They Grew? That was a book I read in probably 1950-something when I was a little kid. And it was all about this noble, poor family <laughs> and how noble it was to be poor. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, people can have dignity, but depending upon the circumstances of that poverty and how widespread it is in your neighborhood, you can be very much affected traumatically by poverty. Ongoing war and community conflict, racism, repeated childhood hospitalization and medical procedures can be traumatic to the point of causing dissociative disorder in a person who, who had, is, comes from a very loving family. Misdiagnosis of conditions. So put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's horribly abused as a child and at five years old you get told you're bipolar or, or by 10 or 12 or 13 you're schizophrenic. Now you're put on all these meds and you're schizophrenic. And that's who you are and that's who you've been seen to be. Yes? Exactly, right. That's right. So we need to say complex PTSD. What's that? Or you get diagnosed as borderline and you know sent away because it, it, there's no treatment for you and you're hopeless. Go away, basically. So again, war experience, financial abuse, or, or exploitation of the persons who depend upon others. Again, there are many more that can be added there. This is just take a brief brief breath uh, moment and uh, reflect on that although there's all this trauma around us, we work with trauma in our jobs, there are other things in life. So traumatic experience challenges a person's ability to cope. They might say they feel like they're gonna die or they're going crazy. They might say, I can't stand it. My answer to that is you are standing it, you're right there. <laughs> and I'm with you. Trauma is defined by the experience of the survivor. And this is from a wonderful book called Growing Beyond Survivor, which can, uh, Survival, which can be found on sidgrin.com or org, I believe. That's in your resources. 
So trauma is defined by the experience of the survivor and denial is a coping of, uh, defense for victimization. So my experience, for instance, in the, in the crisis center, we had a big long uh, intake form and we'd go through this whole social history and then sometimes if I was helping someone else out and I was going to type up what they have done, I'd be reading it and there'd be this whole narrative of all these things this person had been through all their life, all these traumas, trauma, trauma, trauma. Then the next question was, have you been abused? No. I go, what? <laughs> What's all that? Well, they said they hadn't been abused, so they don't feel they've been abused. I said, but why are they here? They're here with the effects of all this. This is when there's a lack of trauma-informed perspective, when there's a lack of trauma-informed understanding, when there's only a focus on what's wrong with you versus what happened to you and what are the effects of that as implied. It's gonna get missed even when it's right there on the page. So I'm not going to leave this slide up very long. It's got several pictures of a lot of different kinds of traumas. But I want you to, to think about this for just a moment, that these are the things your clients brings, bring to you, depending upon where you work and what you do. I want you to think about how you do or how you would speak to a person who's experienced some of these things. Think about how your setting does or does not respect the social history of your clients. So this is a montage of many different kinds of trauma that are out there. I learned some new things when I was looking for this stuff. And people who come from other countries that we may serve in agencies may have gone through some of the things that we, we can't even think about. We don't, we're not even aware of and it's part of their culture. We need to be aware. So again, what would you add? Are there things that you've dealt with and heard about? How's everybody doing? Everybody with me, breathing? Don't need to do a guided meditation here. I'm glad to do one. But okay, we'll move ahead then. When we talk about trauma, we need to think about levels of exposure. There's acute trauma, that event trauma. Chronic trauma re refers to repeated assaults on the child's mind and body, such as chronic sexual or physical abuse. And then the complex trauma has not only to do with the abuse, the neglect, it has to do with the relationship. Uh, we'll look at it a little bit more in the second session. Um, it has to do with the person or child can't get away, or they believe they can't get away. So this would be also a domestic violence situation, because when you're in that situation, you don't know that you have a choice. You don't understand that you have a choice. In certain group situations, that are unhealthy for a lot of people, disrupted type uh, religious groups and secular groups and psychological groups. People don't know they have a choice. So that's part of complex trauma. So those are the three levels that we think about. Think about your clients. It's not a particular, uh, particular diagnosis. When I used to do this, people said, but you're not talking about dissociative identity disorder very much. So I said, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> because that's not the only thing that, that people get from trauma. It is something that a lot of people get from trauma, and there are different levels of that as well. But there are lots of other things that people exhibit. It's not always reportable. It's not a, a, a particular treatment. In some places I've been, people think, oh, you're gonna talk about DBT. I'm like, well, a little bit. That's not all there is to it. It's not always newsworthy. And it's not, as we all know, a rare condition, unfortunately. It is not just the next big fad in behavioral health. I've heard this one. Oh, that's just the big next fad in behavioral health. It's just a training that we have to take. I say, really? <laughs> Do you know that Freud studied the adult children of his medical colleagues? and actually was finding evidence, evidence of incest and then denied it because, of course, he was going to get blackballed. And ever since then, Freudian theory, don't get me wrong, we've got a lot of good things out of Freudian theory. However, we have a lot of damage that has happened over decades because of that. 
We blame children for things that they're, they're not responsible for. And then thus, we don't hold them accountable and guide them in the ways that they need to be. So I want you to keep these points in mind. Any event or situation that causes a person to experience stress so extreme that it overwhelms his or her natural ability to cope, cope can be called trauma, an experience that produces psychological injury or pain, or any situation that leaves you feeling overwhelmed and alone, it does not have to involve physical hitting or touching or sexual. If you feel overwhelmed and alone, don't get me wrong, we all have our days where our thinking's a little distorted. This is not what I mean. I mean chronic feeling alone and overwhelmed. So what are the traumas after, traumas after effects? These are a list of, of things I've seen over the years in all levels of clients. In my private practice, about half my practice, I served people who were on Medicaid and Medicare, and many of them were people who had never worked, primarily because what I've learned is they've been beaten and told they were stupid from the day when they were born, and then they got identified as MR. In some cases, I believe they really weren't MR, and now they're in their 40s and 50s, and this was their identification, that they lived on Social Security, there wasn't much else for them to do. So there's that effect. Under education, under employment, physical ills, and we're gonna look at the ACE study. The, the ACE study showed how the um, early onset of many physical illnesses is uh, really influenced by the stressors, early life stressors. Mental health diagnoses, dysfunctional relationships, Poor parenting of future generations. This is transgenerational. It keeps going on and on and on because people don't know anything different. There's an increased vulnerability to new trauma when we've been uh, a person who's had early life trauma. Maybe we will get involved in criminal activity, even become incarcerated, substance abuse of substances, food, behavioral addictions, and then sometimes suicide. So the next set of uh, effects we're going to look at is what the ACE study found. The ACE it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. It's 10 questions, very specific questions that we'll look at in a minute. Um, later, really. <laughs> uh, about circumstances in the home. What they found, and, and this was done by uh, Kaiser Permanente, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Dr. Robert Anda and Vincent Felitti. This is an ongoing study, but at the time they got, I think, over 17,000 surveys. Apparently, Kaiser Permanente keeps a lot of good records. So they asked people these 10 questions, and then what they found was high correlation with early onset diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and an early death. Uh, high, a higher correlation of people who smoke. The, the more answers uh, yes, the higher the ACE score, the more chance there were, was that you were a smoker or had some kind of addiction and other kinds of unhealthy lifestyle type things going on. So this is not only a mental health problem, it's a health problem. I had plenty of clients that had many, many physical illnesses in addition to all the other diagnoses they had received that I saw as being affected and um, influenced by their mental health. We find out that it hurts us to hurt us. This is a national health problem. So if you run into people that don't want to hear about this, this is a good one to fall back on because it's official. Go to the website and show people the, the information there. There's a lot, a lot of really good information. So who is affected? There was an article in Time Magazine a couple years ago showing how the depression and anxiety shows up in infants. Because now we know ways to, to look at infants and go, oh, that's depression. That's not just colic. And why? So what they found, what we're finding is that, that young, very young children can exhibit depression and anxiety symptoms. 
depression, anxiety, the whole panoply of adult woes are woven into our genomes. That may not be surprising to scientists, but new research shows that these conditions can start to express themselves much earlier than we knew, sometimes during the first year of life. Trauma can trigger the onset, so can stress, and so can still unknown variables. A growing body of research shows that many others, including post-traumatic stress disorder, social anxiety disorder, major depression, insomnia, even prolonged bereavement also afflict young children. So way back when, psychologists told us that th these things didn't affect children and that children have no memory before about five. And that's just not true, but that's where we're coming from. That's why we need this. That's why we need to be really straightforward about this trauma-informed idea. So these next bit of st statistics that we're going to look at are from this report called Models for Developing Trauma-Informed Behavioral Health Systems and Trauma-Specific Services, first written back in 2004. This is an updated draft written by Ann Jennings, a PhD who we'll discuss a little bit more later. Um, she initiated and for eight years directed the first state system office of trauma services in the county of the country for Maine's Department of Behavioral and Developmental Services. This uh, book, you can get, go online and download it. It's about 144 pages, I think, now. It's chock full of wonderful information about models and, and statistics um, and shows the need for what we're doing here. This is the first time I've, I heard the term trauma-informed when I found this online about five years ago. So these are some of the statistics that she shares. Public mental health clients, 51 to 98 percent have been exposed to childhood physical and or sexual abuse. Women and men in substance abuse treatment, 75 percent. Some other sources say 95 percent report abuse and trauma histories. Homeless women with mental illness, 97 percent experience severe physical and or sexual abuse, 87 experience, 87 percent experience both as children and as adults. Female offenders, Eight out of ten with a mental illness reports having been physically and or sexually abused. And I ask you, who doesn't have a mental illness or whatever you want to call it when they're in prison? Uh, Stephanie Covington is a social worker and psychologist who works with women in prison and has written a great deal about addiction and trauma and works with a model called Seeking Safety. Children and adolescents in inpatient and residential treatment in Massachusetts, 82% of all had trauma histories. One of my first jobs in the human service business was uh, at a residential treatment uh, center for children. I took it upon myself to go read all their files when we get new kids. We didn't have to do that, but I thought it was kind of necessary in light of my son's experience and people working with him who didn't seem to know anything about him. And so it really opened my eyes, I, I, all the kids there where I worked from 5 to 17 years old had some kind of trauma in their lives. Teens with drug and alcohol problems are 6 to 12 times more likely to have a history of physical abuse and 18 to 20 times more likely to have been sexually abused than those without substance abuse problems. And you can find stats like this anywhere. Just go online. This is who we're really working with when we're working with all these folks. And this is who we really are. We all started out like this, didn't we? So this is where I emphasize that compassion is the biggest component in this work. We have to have it for ourselves, and we have to have it for those with whom we work. Because this is who we are at heart, and this is how we started out as. So I'd like to ask, ask any of you, just to share briefly, if you will, why are you in this field? Why did you choose to work in human services? You're not going to get rich unless you're Dr. Phil. You're not going to always see the results of your work. Once in a while, I've had the wonderful experience of when I used to live in Ames, I'd be shopping somewhere, and a couple times a young person would walk up to me and go, Hi, Kathy. I'd go, uh, uh, Hi. <laughs> Didn't remember who they were, right? 
and they would tell me they had been in a treatment place where I had worked and that it really helped them turn things around. We don't get that very often. We want to remember that it's out there and, and we need to do something about it. Uh, Dr. Theodore Corbin, who's director of something I'd never heard of before, the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Programs. They're very aware of trauma-informed. He says that trauma-informed care recognizes that when patients come to us in the hospital, they have often been trapped for many years in a cycle of traumatic experiences and symptoms of trauma, and their entrance into the hospital offers us a critical moment to treat that trauma. Is that not refreshing to hear a doctor say something like that in a hospital setting? This is not a behavioral health unit. One article I read recently by a doctor said that he proposed that the ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Questionnaire, should be part of every triage intake in the ER. That this needs to be taken into account. SAMHSA says that most individuals seeking public behavioral health services and many other public services have histories of physical and sexual abuse and other types of trauma-inducing experiences. These experiences often lead to mental health and co-occurring disorders such as chronic health conditions and so forth. And the big thing is that contact with the criminal justice system. It's ridiculous to say the least that, I, I don't know, is it two million people we have incarcerated in this country now? Or we have more people incarcerated than any other country in the world. And it's privatized. Now it's a business, so we gotta keep the business going, right? That's the capital model, capitalism model. So that's kind of what we're fighting. So we need to talk about this paradigm shift, not only as individuals, but in our organizations, socially, nationally, and worldwide. This is a movement, and if you've ever thought that you're fighting against the wind in your work, think about trying to, to convince people around you that are in the field that might not want to hear this. It can be done. Like I said, I'm known as the trauma queen wherever I go, sometimes very disparagingly, but then I hear things years later about somebody I touched and I didn't even know it, that they changed their mind or they went and got some help of their own because that's all, every time I, I have a problem with a nurse practitioner or a nurse or a doctor or another therapist that doesn't want to hear about this, I hear by the wayside about their own ongoing issues, whatever they may be, and I have compassion for that and I know that that's what trips them up. That's what I mean by our mirrors, we all have them. So remember, chant it with me now. <laughs> It's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. So what is this paradigm shift about? The medical model is an illness model, as we said. It's symptom oriented, it's business as usual. Medication is treatment. Anywhere you go in agencies, the military, elite substance abuse, treatment equals medication. As a therapist, when I say treatment, I mean something totally different. It might include medication, it might not. It's reductionist in nature. It, it reduces the person down to a set of symptoms. It doesn't look at the whole person. You're sick, I'm not. I used to tell people, I'm not the expert who's gonna fix you. This is a team effort, I'm your partner. My only agenda for you is that you become your own therapist. I don't wanna be your therapist for 10 years. I don't think that's necessary in most cases. It re-traumatizes people via a lack of validation and acknowledgement and affirmation of their life experiences. There's a revolving door effect with a lifetime of illness and a lifetime of medication that people have to engage in in that model. People have to see themselves as less than in the presence of the white coat. And you'll see people who are very, very conditioned to, I need my meds, I need my meds, I have to see my doctor. Well, what's going to happen then? <laughs> You're going to get a new med that you have to adjust to, and what's your doctor going to say? Not anything different from last time. Trauma-informed is an injury model, meaning there's a recovery process that's going to happen. It's whole person. It looks at the person's strengths, assets, and resilience. It praises them for the fact that they got through whatever the trauma was. It helps them recognize the courage, determination, and resilience that they had. I always congratulate people for even getting to my th for therapy office. I tell people I should have a waiting list of 500 people because I have gold to give people, right? 
but I don't because it's hard to get here. It's compassion-based. It recognizes trauma as a universal experience. It validates experience. It helps people connect to their larger community, helps them move beyond. It uses science, a humanitarian viewpoint, and a spiritual viewpoint. This is something that we don't talk about in our, too much in most of our training programs, the spiritual nature of our work. But when there's been trauma, it challenges the person's view of the world and view of if there's something else. And so when we help people reconnect to themselves and to other people, that is a spiritual work that we're doing. This is another way that I depict that I would like to see it, it work. This is how I see it work with the medical model. Axis one is, all, is the big deal. We focus on axis one and we have all these millions of diagnoses for, for symptoms. Access 2 is kind of by the wayside unless you're particularly annoying and then you get a lecture and pushed out the door. And then the other three may relate a little bit, but we don't give them much credence. So I call those, I call Axis 2, 3, and 4, and 5 kind of the social diagnoses, the, the social uh, areas. This is what I would like to see. Access 1 is important, but it's not the only thing. We need to take into account all those other social effects, and especially when we start to look at access two in a different way, as we will after session two, then we can see that it has a lot of importance as tre into treating the whole person. So here are what I think are some examples of how trauma-informed approach is being enacted. Um, there are places where uh, police officers are being trained for dealing with people and uh, as was brought up to me, even recognizing people who have such things as autism or uh, depression or PTSD. Um, there are places where police officers are being trained in trauma-informed approach when they have to go into homes and take children and help CPS officers take children out of homes so that they can make that experience at least traumatic for the children and in some cases, the training even addresses for the rest of the family, even for the offending parts of the family, so that people can get the help that they need versus get judged. Uh, privacy practices and physical uh, environments. Uh, my son has Social Security benefits, and he had a payee uh, at one time, and I went with him to the office, and it was this skinny little narrow office. And there was an uh, counter with a, a window down at the end and people were just crammed in there. You went up there, stood at this window, and this person talked to you in everyone else's hearing about your finances. That's not privacy. So we need to consider our physical environments. We're going to talk later about um, the sanctuary model. and That is a model for changing organizations and looking at even the physical environment and seeing if the physical environment is trauma-informed. Staffing practices in various settings. Uh, Dr. Bloom, who created the um, sanctuary model, wrote about uh, a paper about all these things, and she says there's chronic short staffing in mental health. We all know that. It's just a fact of life. Well, when there's so much short staffing, there's not time to do the appropriate treatment, just as, as well as my son was in special ed all his life. We had good, caring teachers, but they weren't given the time and the money to be creative. Their class sizes were so large, even in special ed classes, they, they just couldn't do anything else but give kids uh, worksheets to fill in, which I railed against. So those staffing practices, I don't know how they're going to be changed. Sometimes in these presentations, people say, well, where's all this treatment going to come from? I don't know. SAMHSA is mandating this trauma-informed approach. So we're going to have to come up with maybe more creative ways. And it can be done. It can be done. We, it might not be traditional therapy one-on-one. -on -one. It might be groups of people that we educate about these things. I've already mentioned the horse whisper and the dog whisper about working with uh, you know, what the other creature is coming from. Sexual harassment training, sens sensitivity training is a type of trauma-informed training. Integrated medicine, uh, in some places they are uh, having a social worker in the room with the doctor when the doctor is working with a person who has diabetes 
and people with diabetes very often have difficulty accepting the diagnosis, accepting the treatment, and that there's the social worker to help deal with that part. So it's an integrated approach. In other words, it doesn't leave a big part of the picture out so that when the person goes back and their, their symptoms are worse and the doctor yells at them, what's going on, and they're not gonna to talk to the doctor about that. They have somebody to talk to about that now. Somebody to get some coaching, some guidance and support. Uh, we can't do that, so. This 10 things every juvenile court judge should know is a brochure that's been put out by a justice organization. There are uh, courts where the judges have decreed that everyone that works in their court must know uh, these 10 things about trauma and how trauma affects people, kids and families. So that they can work with those kids, not just from a point of punishment and judgment, but a point of, you know, what is this acting out? We use this term acting out all the time, but we never talk about what are they acting out of? 